So in at number 18 in the UK, not charted in the US, is The Secret Kingdom. Uh, in the UK at number 16, it's My Name is Alfred Hitchcock. Again, not charted in the US. Really loved this documentary by Mark Cousins. I can't wait to see it. it's, a, it's just because I've studied um, Hitchcock at uni and it just gave a completely like new, fresh perspective. It was not interested at all in the sort of sociological aspects or about really him as a person. I think there are plenty of documentaries that have been made and should be made about mm. that. This is about his camera angles. Oh, I, I love the Mark Cousins Do you know what I mean? genre of film documentary making. It's incredibly satisfying. Yeah. And, it, and it, it does a really good job of bringing in, I think, you know, fans who might not have seen every single Hitchcock film, but have seen like the biggest ones. But also reminding us that there are some earlier, really smart movies as well, um, where you can see some of his like flashes of brilliance at the very beginning so yeah i would really recommend checking out my name is alfred hitchcock uh the uk number 10 and us number 21 it's the super mario bros movie which i feel like we covered last time we were in we did which is crazy that this is still around i know i mean i i quite enjoyed it but it's <laughs> and it's, it's kind of impressive that it's sticking around in cinemas to the, be honest the power of like family movies good for cinemas everywhere uh, at number nine in the UK, number 18 in the US, it's Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. A lot of kids' movies, actually. Mm. Um, I guess we are firmly in summer holiday territory now. A UK number eight, US number 11, is The Little Mermaid, which, fun, but not as brilliant as the original, because nothing ever could be. Um, a UK number seven, US number eight, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which was, I think, one of the best films I've seen this year. Oh, I need to go see it before it leaves the cinema. It's just excellent. I mean, a real, it's definitely part one of two, which was, we didn't realise and was quite frustrating, but excellent, excellent movie. Mm, that is very frustrating. I'm sure we'll come to this when we talk about Mission Impossible, Dead yeah. Reckoning, but I am not on board this very present trend in Hollywood movies of just dividing a film into two and separating them by a year. I sort of feel like with a trilogy, you don't need that. Mm -mm. You can you can wrap up a story. Uh, UK number six, US number six, it's Insidious, The Red Door. I've not seen this. I have not seen this either because... Uh, there was a policy of not screening it to critics and I have not been able to go to it in cinemas. Fair enough. Which is a shame because I love the Insidious movies and I love Patrick Wilson. Good for him for making his directorial debut. I wish I could have seen it. <laughs> a UK number five, US number five. It's Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Um, <laughs> I, a, I have fun with this one. It is fun. Yeah. It is fun. We have an email. We have um, Dear Obi-Wan and Anakin, I recently went to see Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny at my local cinema. On the whole, I thought it was a good movie, but a bit out of place and surreal for an indie movie. Obviously, Indiana Jones is not an independent mm -hmm. movie because it certainly is not that. The bits about time travel were an example of this. I know that we've seen melting Nazis and people getting their hearts ripped through their chests. But Nazis in the 60s wanting to go back and kill Hitler was a bit extreme. Toby Jones was one of the main things that made this movie stand out for me as he is amazing in everything he does. I feel like Toby Jones often plays quite similar roles. Yeah. Like, like him a lot. But for me, the standout was Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Interesting. So you see, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. But, uh, let me caveat this before the PWB hive come for me. I love yeah. Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Big fan of her work. Have written extensively about Fleabag in my book. Like, very, very big fan. Maybe number two or three on the fan club. Yeah. However, I'm, I one of the things that really worked for me about this movie, and I should caveat... I did not grow up with Indiana Jones for mm -hmm. some reason. So I came to them as an adult. So a bit of the wonder yeah, is missing for me. Sure. But that's a me problem. That's not a film or franchise problem. I love the kind of character that she plays. The kind of really spunky, broad, you know, the sharp-tongued, mm -hmm. um, sort of mischievous personality that she plays. There was, I don't think I fully figured out, I've only seen this film once, what it is that didn't quite work about it for me I think it might be the action things I think I just don't <laughs> the buy the entire film <laughs> no I just I just don't buy Phoebe as an action star oh, like the yes. bits of the film where they start going into sort of Mission Impossible territory yeah I was a bit like this is not the strongest suit of this kind of character of this kind of performer it's not a supernatural of, fit is it it's not it's not so much the supernatural elements because I kind of disagree with the with the listener oh sorry where, I meant a super it's not a very natural 
yes, fit for I Phoebe agree. Waller-Bridge doing yeah. the so, like, action. I, I agree. Hayley yeah. Atwell, I see her as an action oh, star. Yeah. And I don't mean this disrespectfully at all. I think there is, you know, there's an element of what the personality is, what the physicality is of an actor and what we expect from them. They can surprise us. But I just did not really buy that from Phoebe's character in the film. That was the only thing that kept taking me out of it. Interesting. So um, James has gone on to say, as with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I thought that this movie was made to get more money after the success of the first three movies. And it relied on an all-star cast, which was fabulous, and some cameos from characters that appeared in previous movies, which was also fabulous. But nonetheless, it was really nice to see Harrison Ford with his whip and fedora again. Dinkity Donk, hello to Jason Isaacs and Toby Jones, down with the Nazis, apart from ones played by Mads Mikkelsen. <laughs> Poor Mads in this. Poor old Mads. And money Still grabbing film though. companies. <laughs> That's James from Ayrshire. So, UK number four, US number seven, Elemental. Number th- uh, UK number three, US number four, it's Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part One. This is good. Dear your mission, and should you choose to accept? <laughs> LTL, STE, and so on. My wife and I are longtime fans of the Mission Impossible series, and so with the release of Mission Impossible, we decided that it was time for our first cinema trip for four years, what with a global pandemic... I remember that. A relocation, family health problems and the birth of our first son, Ted, it's been a bit tricky to find the time. However, last weekend, we dropped him off with his grandparents and had as wonderful a time as we'd hoped. Taking a couple of hours for ourselves and immersing ourselves in Ethan Hunt's latest scrape was like a hug from an old friend. Even for hopeless Mission Impossible apologists like us, Dead Reckoning isn't as good as the impeccable Fallout. It took a bit too long to get going and had a plot even less essential to the Enterprise than normal. But frankly, that couldn't matter less. The handcuffed car chase through Rome was a brilliant reminder of how action and comedy go hand in hand. A certain train-based sequence was a nightmare of escalating tension and everyone involved seemed to be having a blast. While the Bond series continues to get more and more self-serious and caught up in dealing with its baggage and mythos, the makers of the Mission Impossible films have learned have leaned into what makes their series great. More ingenious set pieces than you can shake an improbably accurate rubber mask at, a great cast fully committed to the premise, and more importantly, a sense of its own ridiculousness while still taking it seriously. Fewer psychodramas and more dodging grand pianos in midair. Love the show, Steve, and hello to Jason et al. Will. Thank you, Will. At number two in the UK and the US, you've guessed it, it's Oppenheimer. Dear Fermi and Bohr, Oppenheimer was a fantastic cinema experience and walking out of the screening in a daze, bones still rattling into a Brixton ritzy <laughs> lobby full of seemingly hundreds of people dressed head to toe in pink. <laughs> rose up to the eyeballs on Friday night was also quite something. As the cinema gods intended. <laughs> Gillian Murphy's performance was electrifying and the scene running up to the Trinity test was incredibly tense. That was their incredibly, not mine incredibly. In the way that <laughs> Nolan does best, copying from Interstellar, the thing of the tension being cut with a vast explosion happening that nobody can hear. I feel like Nolan uses... Sorry, this is me now. Nolan uses silence in this film to such great effect. Mm -hmm. However, I agree with Mark. I'm going back to the email. I agree with Mark that the centre of the story felt slightly off the mark. While it does feature the cross-cutting, timey-wimey stuff we've come to expect, I maybe thought we'd get something even higher concept than this, given the vast array of quantum physicists on show. They are just actors, though. In past films, thinking particularly of Inception, Interstellar and Dunkirk, all of which I loved, the cross-cutting time jumps intersect in a way to reveal the heart of the story. In these past films, this has been something of a global or even cosmic significance. In Oppenheimer, while the awful weight of the bomb on both the world and on those who made it is an important part of the film, the focus of the intercutting storylines end up revealing a story about nuclear policy and administration in the 1950s. This just seems less significant than the bomb itself, or the moral questions of the bomb's creation, so it seems a misstep to centre the plot in this way. Additionally, we the audience have the benefit of hindsight that there was not, or at least hasn't yet been, a global thermonuclear war, which gives the outcome of that 1950s struggle less import. All in all, very glad to have seen the film in 35 mil, but it's not Nolan's best, in my humble opinion. That's from Alex in South London. That last line that you've written reminds me of my dad when he came out of the King's speech, only to say that it was a bit predictable. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that was my dad's takeaway. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, that is a good point. We're, we haven't lived through, we knew, we, you know, one of the crux of the, the issues that was surrounding the film was whether or not the whole world would go up in flames. I mean, but, the, you can say that about any historical yes. film or any biopic. Yeah. We know what happened. But I think, and I think this is both... But they a, didn't, crucially. No. Well, arguably, did they, though? You know, we could philosophize about it and say, maybe they kind of did, mm. because are we on the brink of another nuclear mm -hmm. of a nuclear war? Probably. <laughs> Not to get too intense so early on, but probably. Yeah. It's always on our minds. We don't, so we're going to give our proper takes yes. in take three. What is your sort of top line on Oppenheimer though? So I think one of the greatest interests and one of the greatest downfalls of this film is its own concern with the weight of genius. Mm. And I have many more things to say about Oppenheimer. I will just say in a top line way, I am not the biggest Christopher Nolan fan, with some exceptions. The Prestige is one of my favorite films of his oeuvre. I really love The, the Dark Knight, as does everyone else. But Oppenheimer, I was trepidatious because I have not loved the previous few that he's made, but I greatly enjoyed it. I greatly enjoyed it both as a historical drama mm -hmm. and as a as a biopic that was trying something very different to what the formulaic biopics usually have done, especially in the last five years or so. But I'll have much more to say in take three when we do our unrated, unlimited Barbenheimer special. Fantastic. I have to say, just as a vehicle for Killian Murphy being recognised as one of the greatest actors of our time, I am so here. Just his face in close-up in 70 mil and IMAX. Just cinema, baby. It is. It really is. Dear Fat Man and Little Boy, LTL, second time emailer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take Fat Man. Just as Jaws <laughs> is famously not about the shark, Oppenheimer is not about the atomic bomb. It's about hats. Director oh. Christopher Nolan puts Oppenheimer, played wonderfully by Killian Murphy, in his trademark pinched front fedora, and he looks great in it. Did you notice that none of the other lead characters gets to wear any hat? Einstein is awarded a smoking cap, yes, but all the physicists and top army personnel working away in the New Mexican sun are bareheaded at a time when wearing a hat was a normal feature of men's style. The key comes at the very end, no spoiler, when someone dons a hat to accept their doom. Oppenheimer has, of course, been doomed from the start. <gasps> I'm so into this reading. I love this tech. This is great. <laughs> Dude, I love it. It's a great film, yes. Long and complicated and a bit redolent of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy with so many men talking in rooms. But Nolan does justice to a complex and vital story. Love to Jason, Klaus Fuchs and any other member of the British nuclear establishment. Cheers, Mark McCurgow, who has got a PhD in nuclear physics from the University of Birmingham a long time ago. So he knows what he's talking about and he's talking about hats. I love it. I'm really glad Physicists, that, that email they're came not in. like us. <laughs> um, I, can you possibly hazard a guess at what has taken <laughs> the charts by storm, both in the UK and the it's US? The pink domination. Dear Ken and Ken, as you say, Mattel have had their cake and they eat it with this film. For example, I purchased the I Am Knuff multi oh God, I want that. hoodie so after watching. This was a really great film, though. There really is something for everyone. The first 15 minutes were pure chaos and gag after gag. Chaos is right. I think that's a great... It's such organised chaos, this mm -hmm. film. The screening I was in was definitely an advert for going to the cinema. The atmosphere was electric beforehand, and I was worried that the very loud and chatty crowd weren't going to quiet down before the film started, with cries of, Hi Barbie! bouncing back and forth between pink-clad cinema goers. Thankfully, they did, and there were so many jokes in the film that there probably wasn't time for people to chat. Most people were laughing throughout. Will Ferrell seems to be left out of the discussions, but I really enjoyed him being a quintessential Will Ferrell character. Not for everyone, I realise, as the dopey CEO. But rightfully, Margot Robbie is recognised as a fantastic lead actor, perfectly able to change between a plastic full smile, a real smile, and the surprise at having real tears. I could continue for pages about every line that I found funny, but I think I need to watch it again to see what I missed. Definitely rewatchable, and it's essential to see it in the cinema with a large audience. 
Tinkity Tonk, etc. And that's from Andrew Griffiths. I think, again, this is something, I, I'm getting the vibe that you loved Barbie. But Are you getting you, the vibe from my Greta Gerwig pink on pink That's what I'm getting the vibe from. Barbie. I loved Barbie. <laughs> I loved Barbie. I have a lot of thoughts on Barbie. Some of them are kind of achy. Some of them are kind of complicated mm-hmm. because of the whole Mattel, you know, yeah. situation, which we should not ignore. I think it's valid to discuss yeah. that without you know, insulting the film. I I just want to echo what you said. I love Barbie as a film of contradictions. Mm-hmm. It should not work, but it works. Mm-hmm. It's organized chaos. It's emotional artif- artifice. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so completely unpredictable while completely fitting a brief mm-hmm. of what you expect sort of a, a Barbie doll come to life yeah. movie to be. It is genuinely a stroke of of sort of genius, and it's it's high femme cinema. It's high femme cinema, baby, and I love it. I love seeing the pink. I love seeing all the cinephile references to mm-hmm. it, and it is funny. It is one of the funniest films I've seen recently, and like you say, like my screening was uproarious and I, I thought this has proved to be a very divisive movie we're going to get into it later in take mm-hmm. three um i would say people seem to be taking it incredibly seriously for a film that is not maybe supposed to be taken particularly seriously i'm not surprised it's being taken so seriously interesting um we have an email here from charlie and lucy saying dick hen and alan long-time listeners first-time emailers Some say that tragedy occurs in the gap between expectations and reality. By that logic, Greta Gerwig's Barbie is, we think, a tragic film. I'm so sad about this. The least you would expect from this much-hyped film is a good time. For us, it failed to meet the six-laugh test, unlike, unexpectedly, Mission Impossible. Gerwig on the podcast said this film was for everyone. We are not parents, but we felt Barbie lacked the universal appeal of the Lego movie. Sarah Vine, who is a Daily Mail columnist, thinks Barbie is bizarre and anti-man. We expected, therefore, a modern feminist masterpiece. We got repackaged 1990s ideas, which in our view reinforced rather than smashed the gender binary. To be fair to the writers, it's hard to see how they could have ever made the film we deserved. It's uncomfortable to see women in pink flocking to cinemas to uncritically absorb propaganda for Barbie. When Mattel inserts itself into the film, it's without nuance or narrative justice. It's impossible to ignore Mattel's complicity in creating and upholding the norms the film pretends to be to critique. Tinkety Tonk and Down with Mattel from Charlie and Lucy, sometimes Suffolk, sometimes London. P.S. It was great to have a deserved round of applause to the projectionist at the BFI IMAX before the better half of our Barbenheimer double bill. Anna. What do you think? I have to say, the one line in that that I really take issue with is um, it's uncomfortable to see women in pink flocking to the cinemas to uncritically absorb propaganda for Barbie because the word uncritically feels very patronising in that sense of the idea if you're going, if you're excited about a movie and you're going to dress up because you're excited about the film that you aren't going to approach it with a kind of critical eye. I I would just like to say I've seen, this is obviously anecdotal, but I, I don't think it is that much. You see everyone dressed up. If people want to dress up in pink, men, women, non-binary folk, they dress up in pink. It's a personal choice if you want to engage with the Barbie fever or not. Nobody's forcing anyone to engage with it. Nobody's forcing people to say, hi, Barbie, hi, Ken, to each other. It's a really anti-fun email, if I'm honest. And what is wrong with people enjoying the act of going to the cinema? With what, if this was a, a different movie, if this was an Avengers movie, mm-hmm. I don't think those emails would have been sent. <laughs> I don't think people would have been said, oh, well, you know what? This is an anti human movie because it's just. It's about superheroes uh, yeah. who aren't human. It's about mutants or it's about aliens or whatever. I think there is such an anti femininity aspect to our. Co- our current culture, anything that is heightened, anything that is pink, anything that is extremely um, feminine, overtly performatively feminine, I don't think in this day and age, in this level of media literacy that we all have existing between constantly shifting uh, trends, visual language, social media, TV, streaming, cinema, YouTube, everything else, our understanding is no longer uncritical. We are fully aware that this is a product that's been turned into a movie. I have a lot more thoughts about that in Take Mm -hmm. 3, but 
as a as a main thing. We are in, we are aware that this is a Mattel product. Mm-hmm. Mattel is also not the first brand that has now decided to make movies. Mm-hmm. Far from the first. Um, they have learned from other people's mistakes. But I'm not here to defend a global corporation at all. But I do think there is a there is this rabid kind of desire to go against the hype. And the hype machine for Barbie has been extraordinary. Mm-hmm. But I think if you're got, just going to put down audiences for going to enjoy a film and to put down anyone who is embracing uh, a hyper version of femininity, the implication of that, which I take a lot of umbrage with, is that anything that is high femme, anything that is hyper feminine, anything that is girly and pink by its association with girlishness and femininity is superficial, uncritical and unthinking. And that is very stupid. Sorry, you can bleep that. Anna, I love you. <laughs> Time for an ad break. I love you too. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. While you're here, check out all the other videos because they're cool too, aren't they? Yeah. And if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermit and Mayo's take, then check out our social channels. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I, I would. I have done. Excellent.